Okay, I think we can get started. We'll probably have people joining us um, still for a few minutes. And of course, even afterwards, but um, let's start with because we have a lot of program for for today. So welcome to this webinar on nutrient recycling in the grip of geopolitics. Uh, my name is Emma Kala uh, and I'm a leading researcher here at the Finnish Institute of International Affairs. Um, and I will be moderating the webinar today. Uh, the idea of this webinar is to consider the interplay between global geopolitics uh, and the management of es essential uh, nutrients necessary for agriculture and food security. Uh, and this, uh, of course, is an increasingly important question, uh, especially in the in the after the COVID-19 pandemic and the, the beginning of the Russian war of aggression in Ukraine. Uh, which will have uh, and are already having uh, considerable implications on issues like fertilizers and uh, and they are also prompting this um, uh, stronger emphasis on regionalization and diversification. Um, and this will have implications on agricultural production and food security and other important things. And we'll get to the bottom of, of these issues uh, today. Um, I will first just uh, mention that uh, and very much emphasize that we are uh, organizing this webinar together with the Natural Resources Institute Finland, LUKE. Uh, so my big uh, thanks go to all of the LUKE colleagues, uh, many of whom will be uh, joining us and, and speaking today, but also those of you who have been um, uh, participating in the organization of the webinar behind the scenes, uh, so to say. Uh, and especially to the Finnish speakers in the audience, I should also mention that uh, this will be, or this is the first part of, of this two-part series that we're organizing on these broad uh, topics. Um, so the second webinar will take place on the 6th of March, uh, also online, uh, and it will uh, focus more on agriculture, regional politics, inequality and geopolitics in the Finnish context. Um, so look for uh, for that, then especially you Finnish speakers, because un unfortunately this webinar will only take place in Finnish. Okay, but back to today's uh, program, uh, we have quite a full um, webinar ahead of us, uh, and I will uh, let um, my colleague Mick from Luke set the scene for, for today. Just to briefly note that uh, we will have essentially three uh, kind of keynote spe speeches here in the beginning, uh, which will then be followed by a panel discussion, and I will present all the speakers as, as we go along in the, in the program. Um, but uh, now I will give the floor to Mikko, but also just mention that uh, in fact there has been a kind of a change of uh, a program. Uh, we were initially going to have Johanna Kohl from Luke, who is director of the Circular Bioeconomy Research Program there, uh, to give the opening words, but unfortunately she broke her leg, uh, so she is unable to join us today and hopefully she'll be better soon. Uh, but please go ahead, Mikko, and uh, give us the, the sort of uh, setting for the webinar. Thank you, Emma. I will start by trying to share my screen. Can you see the presentation? Yes, very well. Thank you. So thanks, thanks, Emma. My name is Mikko Vekrut. I'm a research manager slash senior scientist working in Luke, and my focus area is transition to circular bioeconomy. Uh, as Emma mentioned, I'm kind of substituting for Johanna Kohl, who is the head of our circular program, and I will do my best to fill in her shoes, as they say. Uh, actually, Johanna had prepared three slides before her slippery slipping accident in these wintry conditions, and then he, she handed them over to me, but with the mandate of editing them as I wish. So add, I added uh, this this slide. So kind of the assignment was to give the broad picture behind the, the more expert and in-depth 
presentation and discussion we, which we are having. And this is this is the slide or the biggest picture I could come up with. Uh, I'm a geographer by education, so geography is, is a discipline interested in space, but also also time. So and of many times related to historical perspective. So uh, this is the ten years. Uh, 10,000 years of nutrient cycles in two minutes. So with a rather ambitious goal, but let's see how I, how I manage. Uh, well, I'm thinking the whole whole time frame of the thing which uh, the folk, the theme which we are dealing with nutrient cycles. I put the starting point to roughly to eight or six uh, six thousand uh, BC when the hunter gatherer society, uh, not society at the month at the time, but uh, mankind move from hunter-gatherer to the settled communities, so in a certain location uh, instead of migrating. And this was, of course, associated with the agriculture, birth of agriculture, cultivating land, which uh, happened uh, and consequently uh, affected the spatial surplus of nutrients and food and birth of cities at the same time. So in this sense, the phenomena which we are now dealing with, the, the spatial uh, uh, dimension of nutrient cycles was emerged at this time, and still at the at the present era, cities are overconsumptious on nutrient and food, whereas the nutrients and and food comes to the farming. So this this is the birthplace of this this process. Uh, then the second era in time, I, I thought it's worth mentioning, is the Green Revolution, roughly from 60s onwards. When the globalization, uh, the, the Green Revolution was associated with, uh, as as, many, as most of us, of course, know, uh, aiming to increase the yield of crops and the global uh, sense to feed the population. And one of the key components was the better, more efficient use of fertilizers, of, of course, pesticides as well. And uh, the, the volume of global trade as a fertilizer increased. Third and final point in time I should emphasize is the February 24th when Russia decided to launch the full scale uh, attack to Ukraine, which has many consequences in ge geopolitical and economic and global trade, uh, including the increase of fertilizer prices, especially nitrogen, even though as far as I've understood uh, the prices have now dropped close to the pre-war season. But, but nonetheless, uh, uh, agricultural uh, outputs uh, were heavily infected, as, as Ukraine is one of the still in, in, uh, important exporter of grains, but also the inputs, the fertilizer trade. So this this is the picture of the situation we are now. Uh, a few weeks ago, I saw this uh, this heading in one uh, in Helsinki Sanomat. Uh, interview of the Yara, the biggest uh, fertilizer company globally. The CEO uh, he mentioned in an interview that Europe is dangerously dependent on Russian fertilizers. Uh, we have a Yara representative here in the in the panel, so I wouldn't go that that deep into discussion. But this this is anyway anyway a signal that uh, uh, we are not alone with UPI, uh, the FIA, and uh, Luke to think that this. Uh, this webinar is worth organizing. Uh, if this is the situation at the current context, what is the solution? And now we come a bit closer to my focus area and circular program and all, all in general the work of Luke. Uh, one potential uh, argument or solution, of course, it's a partial solution to the geopoliticalization of nutrient cycle is more closed and localized nutrient cycles, including the use of uh, bio-based or circular fertilizers. And also at this stage, I'm not a sole, a sole scientist myself, but I have been in, informed by those who are that speaking of nutrient cycles as an entity is not that that constructive because the, the main, main nutrients related to the agriculture uh, phosphorus and nitrogen, they have a quite a different geopolitical loadings. But that is just one map about the nutrients. Distribution, and this is basically the same with the phosphorus. I will not take more time to present this, this bigger picture. 
as Emma opened his camera. I would assume my time is up. So thank you. That was the, trying to set, the, as Emma said, set the scene or open up the big question for the expert expert uh, talks and discussion. Looking forward to great few hours. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Mikko. Uh, and sorry for having to kind of cut you short <laughs> and yeah. also for not uh, presenting you. Uh, but luckily you did it your, yourself. But uh, thanks for that. We will now move ahead to the to the rest of the speakers. Uh, so first we have uh, Guy Faure, who is from, uh, he works at CIRAD, uh, which is a French agricultural research and international cooperation organization. Uh, but he's also currently posted at the European Commission at the DG INTPA. Uh, as an expert supporting EU research and innovation pro programs uh, there. Uh, and he, he <laughs> you will give us uh, the kind of a global picture with regard to food security and nutrient cycles and, and these issues. So you have about 15 uh, minutes. Uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as you said, uh, uh, Emma, I work at the INPA in the unit uh, Sustainable Food System and Fisheries. That's the reason why we deal with uh, uh, food system, food crisis, and we are fully involved in the fertilizer discussion at international level, participating in different uh, discussion arena with G7, G20, the global fertilizer challenge and so on. Uh, so uh, with uh, the, the war, uh, the Russian aggression in Ukraine uh, and the food crisis, uh, uh, the response of the EU was uh, based on the three, uh, based on the four priorities. The first priority was uh, what is called solidarity, so second one, sustainable production, the third one, trade, and uh, the fourth one, multilateralism. Solidarity, uh, the first priority is to facilitate the transport of uh, food and fertilizer, but also to address humanitarian aid in uh, fragile countries. The sustainable production, and I will talk more about that, is about uh, how to, to increase uh, production and to better make use of uh, uh, fertilizers. The trade is to facilitate trade and, uh, between countries regarding food and fertilizers. And multilateralism is to insist on the fact that uh, the solution is also based on discussion with different uh, uh, partners, different countries and different international agencies. Based on this, uh, the, 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 the EU uh, provided a, a communication. So a communication is a document, uh, uh, in a document to, 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 to develop line to text regarding some uh, subjects. And the communication from the Commission to the European Parliament, the Council, and the European Economic and Social Committee uh, is uh, aiming at uh, uh, defining the line to take and the position regarding uh, fertilizers. And the, the communication is called ensuring availability and affordability of fertilizers. It was uh, published in November 22. So based on that, uh, we have the, the full, uh, let's say, the full line to take for Europe, but also the international dimensions. Uh, I, I will mainly talk about Africa because uh, with uh, with uh, the Jinpa, we work with different continents, Asia, Latin America, but uh, we have uh, our priority to work with Africa, and we, Africa is really, really. Uh, well, under pressure regarding the food crisis and the fertilizer crisis, so it's one of the main uh, uh, points of uh, interaction, discussion regarding food crisis and uh, fertilizer crisis. Uh, so in uh, in Africa, due to the huge uh, uh, increase of uh, fertilizer prices, as mentioned before, and uh, 
also due to the crisis of availability of uh, uh, fertilizers. One of the main uh, proposals of uh, governments, uh, but also uh, actors uh, uh, from the private sector, from farmers' organization, is to increase uh, the production of fertilizer. Fertilizer in the narrative is perceived as a key element to boost production, but also to to sustain, uh, to, to, to develop sustainable farming system. It means, for example, in Africa with fertilizer, you, you can increase the biomass production. And if you increase your biomass production, you can uh, increase production of grain, for example, but also to increase the carbon sequestration and improve the, uh, the quality of the soil. So the question is how to boost the production of uh, fertilizers in Africa, how to facilitate imports, but also how to facilitate distribution of fertilizers in, uh, in Africa. Uh, you have to be aware that uh, usually the price of fertilizers uh, uh, at farm gate uh, is twice uh, in Africa is twice the price of fertilizers uh, when uh, arriving in Africa in the main uh, uh, harbors because the cost of transport is so huge that the, the price of fertilizer is, is a really is really increasing due to this cost of production. Uh, in our discussion with the partners, we say, okay, there is a fertilizer crisis, but if farmers, especially in Africa, don't use a lot of fertilizers, we talk about 20 kilograms of fertilizer per hectare, which is quite low in comparison with Europe when you talk about 120, 140 kilograms of fertilizer per hectare. In this case, you have just 20 kilograms of fertilizers. But farmers don't use uh, uh, fertilizers uh, and don't use a lot of fertilizer before the crisis due to a, a certain number of uh, reasons. The first one, uh, is about agronomic reasons. Uh, we have a lot of uh, poor soils in Africa, so very low response of uh, uh, low crop response uh, on fertilizer. It means uh, uh, the increase of yield due, due to fertilizer is not as high as expected or as high as what we can uh, uh, observe in uh, research fields or for in experiments. Uh, but also uh, there are some uh, difficulties for farmers to really valorize uh, uh, their fertilizer due to the lack of equipment, uh, the low level, low, low technical level. So there are some agronomic reasons, but there are also some economic reasons. The first one is for sure the price of the fertilizers in comparison with the price of the agricultural outputs, but also the risk taken by farmers when they use fertilizer especially in dry area with a climatic risk and the risk to lost uh, their, their harvest due, due to climate uh, events. And that's the reason why some farmers are not uh, are quite reluctant to use uh, fer uh, inorganic fertilizer, but also the question of access to market to stabilize the access to market. So the reason are of low use of fertilizer are specific agronomic reasons specific to Africa, but also economic reasons due to the lack of uh, well-structured value chains. So in this discussion, what we, we try to, 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 to discuss with our partners and it's our, let's say, position, it's not really a fertilizer's crisis. It's more a soil health issue in Africa, but also in Europe. And the main problem is how do we can increase soil health and to, to develop and to sustain, to promote more sustainable integrated soil and soil fertility management, taking into account the question of erosion, the question of carbon sequestration, the question of biological life of soil and to go beyond only the, the access uh, to nutrition, nutrition cycle, but to have a, a holistic uh, perspective regarding soil health. And that's the reason why we really, in the international debate, 
promote the agroecological approaches, to have this holistic approach. It's quite a debate with uh, our partners, it's quite a debate with uh, some uh, actors regarding why do we promote agroecological uh, approaches. And for us, this holistic approach to address soil health with an integrated perspective is to say that fertilizer is part of the picture, but it's not the, the main solution. We first need to mobilize uh, the local solution with more legumes. So with research results, we can say that legumes can capture around 20 to 40 kilograms per hectare of nitrogen, which is quite high. We have to, to work on uh, crop livestock integration to make big, better use of manure. We also need to work on agroforestry, to, especially with uh, uh, legume trees to capture nitrogen, but also to, to increase uh, biological life of soil, to increase uh, the quality of the soil. And when you mobilize all these elements, Still, you may lack some nutrition to achieve the objective in terms of yields. And in this case, you have to mobilize uh, uh, external uh, fertilizers. So the question is how we can strengthen the capacities of actors to really uh, better manage their farming system based on agroecological approaches. And what is the contribution of fertilizers, external fertilizer to this uh, uh, discussion around soil fertility. That's the reason why also we put specific emphasis on uh, uh, organic fertilizer, for sure on-farm fertilizers, but still uh, uh, there are some difficulties, but it's a huge uh, uh, contribution to, to, to nu the nutrition cycle. But we have we can we need also to focus on off farm organic fertilizers we we carried out a study on organic fertilizer and biofertilizer in, in africa and there is quite a high potential to better recycle nutrition uh, in africa and the main source of nutrition uh, in Africa, but also in other continents, is is located in urban area, and uh, if you make use of uh, waste, and also we can address human excreta to produce organic fertilizers, you can have a quite significant contribution to the recycling of nutrition and to 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 bring what is needed by the crops regarding nutrition. Uh, the study is quite interesting in this case. And uh, by working on uh, this type of organic fertilizers based on uh, urban waste and uh, uh, with some experience on human excreta, uh, we can support some investments to recycle and to, to address this issue of recycling and waste management in urban cities, which is quite uh, critical issue regarding health for uh, people living in cities. But we also need to work, and we say that, we also need to, to work uh, on, uh, uh, let's say, biostimulants, and especially to work on the bacteria and fungi uh, able to promote and to uh, foster biological life and to increase the capacity of uh, uh, bacteria to capture nitrogen from the atmosphere. And uh, we, not in Africa, but in Latin America, we have a quite important uh, private sector uh, investing in such technologies uh, to increase the fertility of the soil and to bring the needed nutrition to the crops. Uh, it's some uh, Private firms invest in this, some small ones, some uh, large ones, such as Bayer, for example, but also some farmers, large farmers, investing in new equipments to produce bacteria to better fix nitrogen. So it's uh, it's an option we have to 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 address. 
And finally, what we say also, we also need our uh, green fertilizers. And when we talk about green fertilizer, we talk about fertilizer produced by uh, renewable energy. In Africa, there are some very huge investment regarding uh, hydrogen production and parts of this production, hydrogen production could be used to produce green ammonia and to produce what it's called green uh, fertilizers. But still the costs are, qu are quite important and still the need, uh, there is still, um, we need to secure the use of such uh, fertilizer for African needs and not for export. As you may know, uh, Africa produce inorganic fertilizer, but 80% of the inorganic fertilizer produced in Africa, Egypt, Nigeria, uh, Senegal, Morocco, are exported outside Africa. So the question is not only a question of production, but the question of how you can address the internal needs of your markets by regulation, economic incentives, cost reductions. Uh, I think uh, I can still talk about uh, this topic, and but uh, I just want to mention that we have this discussion with uh, our partners with African Union, which is quite interested in this, trying to boost the use and production of inorganic fertilizer, but also trying to develop new avenues to address the nutrition cycles and based on new solutions. So I'm quite interested in this discussion. We work with economic, uh, regional economic communities, such ECOWAS, uh, to work on this topic on uh, integrated soil fertility management, bio uh, inputs, and agroecological approaches. And for sure, we have discussion with governments at different countries, in different countries, to address this issue and to make sure we, we can uh, have a, a broad perspective to address this quite important important soil issue in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Guy. Uh, thank you. It was really interesting. And thank you especially for providing so many solutions uh, that, and, and also things that are already, already ongoing. Uh, we have a few short minutes uh, in, in case there are any questions, but we don't have any, any questions from the audience uh, right now. Uh, you, you can still write them in the chat. Um, but I actually was wondering uh, if you can shortly reply, uh, because you mentioned the, the climate uh, risk, which is, is causing problems, obviously, and is making producers reluctant to invest on, on fertilizers. Uh, what do you think is the situation? I mean, will the situation get worse now when, when climate change is advancing and the climate risks will be increasing and is it already visible in, in your view? For sure it's quite uh, visible and uh, uh, farmers are quite uh, aware about climate change and uh, for them uh, the risk is increasing due to drought, due to floods. The risk is increasing so they are reluct reluctant, they are Yes, this situation makes the investment more difficult for them regarding fertilizer, but regarding all uh, the other di uh, dimension for equipment, for land management, for uh, uh, mechanization and so on. So it's quite an important issue. The forecasts are not so good. The, so there is a forecast uh, indicating that we will face a decrease in, uh, in terms of yield regarding the main production, such maize. So the question is to work on uh, adaptation. And the reason why we support uh, this agroecological uh, approach uh, because uh, we promote a more diversified farming system with more diversified crops, uh, with more uh, integration of livestock, but also with more trees. And to some extent, um, the situation you mentioned, the Green Revolution, which is mainly based on monocropping or, let's say, kind of standardization of a uh, farming system, is... Uh, this type of uh, farming system based on the green revolution approach is more 
sensitive to climate change. It is not able to 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 fully address uh, climate change, and we need to work on uh, uh, new solution to make better use of biodiversity. Uh, I mentioned trees, I mentioned crop diversification, but we can also mention the diversity of the same uh, uh, species with different varieties, uh, uh, with different characteristics in the same plot to address this issue of uh, more variability or more increase of pests uh, and disease due, due to climate change and due to the more uh, pressure on land. So that's the reason why we, we need to have uh, Yes, to, 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 to address uh, new avenues to provide to farmers to, with new solution, and new perspective. Thank you. All right, great. Thank you so much, Guy. Uh, and, and please stick around still. Uh, we have a lot of um, interesting things to come uh, still, but we will now move on to our next two following speakers. Uh, so we will have the, the view from um, kind of a more geopolitical point of view, and then from the agricultural sector, I would say. So the next, uh, the first one of these two presentations will be given by my colleague here at FIA, Marco Siddi, who is a leading researcher and he coordinates the project, uh, the global politics of the energy transition. Uh, and he will now uh, talk to us on under the title Conflict, Geopolitics and Food Security. And you have up to 15 minutes. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Emma. I will try to share my slides with you. I hope you can see them. Yes, we see them. Full screen as well. Yeah, not yet. Yes, now. OK, excellent. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I slightly adapted the title, but more or less it's uh, as you said. Uh, geopolitics, energy transition and food security. Uh, what I would like to do is to provide a slightly different uh, perspective by highlighting the energy uh, transition and uh, uh, the interplay between these various uh, factors. Uh, uh, the energy transition is taking place at different speeds uh, uh, around the globe, but it is one of the main uh, trends uh, we see, at least in the global north. Um, together with the rise of geopolitical uh, uh, competition, and this has an impact uh, uh, on, on uh, food security. Um, however, the cause effect consequences are sometimes a bit more complex, and I hope I'll clarify this a bit in my presentation. Um, so I was counting on um, my uh, um, predecessors in this seminar to, uh, as they did, uh, talk about food security and uh, clarify the concept. Uh, and they can do that but much better than me, so I won't go uh, into that. Um, I will stress what we mean uh, by energy transition, a uh, topic that has come up already in various ways. Um, from an energy perspective, this means the uh, shift from uh, fossil-based systems of energy production and consumption uh, to systems based on renewable energy, such as uh, wind and solar, and uh, storage systems such as lithium-ion batteries. And uh, the transition, um, green transition or low carbon transition, to use another term that uh, we often hear, um, will also feature uh, large scale electrification and uh, uh, improvements in energy storage and related uh, regulation. Uh, now, how does this relate uh, to uh, climate change, food security? Um, so the transition is mostly a response to, uh, to climate change, um, which in turn, as we just had, also impacts on, on food production. Uh, geopolitics come into the uh, game um, and has an influence both on energy prices. Again, the example we have from 2022 with the Ukraine conflict is very uh, clear. And then energy prices uh, have an impact on the cost of uh, food production. Um, at the same time, this relationship is complex because we also saw in the recent past that um, a conflict can originate from issues with food security. 
If we think about the Arab Spring, one of the uh, causes that is usually uh, mentioned for social unrest was a uh, rise in uh, uh, food prices and bread prices uh, uh, in particular. Uh, and more recently, we saw that the, the rise in geopolitical competition, and I will come back to, to that uh, later, um, but Growing geopolitical competition and uh, global shocks uh, related, for example, to pandemics, so to COVID-19, uh, also impacted uh, global supply chains, including energy and, and uh, food chains. Um, so this is, so we, we are witnessing, uh, in a way, um, a politicization of food, which is part and parcel of uh, rising uh, uh, geopolitical competition. Uh, another example that actually stems from uh, before 2022 uh, is the 2014 crisis between uh, Russia, uh, the EU and, uh, and the West. Following Russia's uh, annexation of Crimea, the European Union imposed uh, sanctions uh, on Russia. Uh, and uh, Russia decided to retaliate with counter sanctions, which focused on uh, food sanctions. So um, um, sanctioning food imports from uh, the EU and the West. And the idea was that uh, this would also uh, um, help uh, the country to become uh, more autonomous in terms of food security. So food is once again seen as uh, part of a strategic game. Before I return to this, let me say a few words on uh, um, renewable energy. So the energy transition and the geopolitics of it, and we will see how this interconnects with our uh, topics today. Uh, the geopolitics of renewable energy is a bit, is quite different from the geopolitics of fossil fuels, which continues to play a role uh, today, as we as we saw, as we keep seeing, for example, also in the context of the crisis in the Middle East uh, now. Uh, but when we talk about renewable energy, um, there's a few factors, a few new factors that uh, matter. Uh, access to technology, to green technology is essential and it's not available to, uh, to everyone, especially uh, not to poorer countries uh, in the global south. Uh, access to uh, the primary sources, uh, so the rare earths, critical uh, minerals, uh, is also a source of contention. And storage uh, technology is also uh, newer, it's quickly improving. Uh, so patents, uh, when it comes to this, or uh, technological know-how uh, is also part of the geopolitical uh, competition. Uh, on the one hand, uh, we should keep in mind that compared to fossil fuels, um, uh, renewable energy production tends to be much more uh, decentralized. And um, once the technology is available, uh, this means that more countries will be able to produce energy uh, domestically and hence will become uh, more self-sufficient. Now, um, there's however a few uh, weak spots, uh, we can say, uh, about um, systems based on renewable energy. For example, um, these systems will rely greatly on so-called smart grids, uh, which are systems, uh, digital systems that uh, uh, allow essentially moving green energy around uh, uh, large markets, ideally uh, quickly, uh, depending on where production is higher, which is of course dependent on uh, intermittent renewable energy production, and of course uh, where uh, demand uh, is higher. Uh, now, smart grids, uh, however, are at greater risk uh, of cyber attacks. So this is one of the vulnerabilities. Uh, similarly, we will see, um, we are seeing already competition in terms of access to, to rare earths. Um, um, so rare earths, I come to this in a second, are uh, um, 17 elements in the periodic table which are essential for digital and uh, uh, green technologies. Also a very important point where the energy transition comes or intersects with the issues of food, food security is the role of bioenergy, so biofuels and biomass in the transition. 
Uh, on the one hand, uh, uh, bioenergy is seen as one of the um, drivers of the energy transition. At the same time, uh, much, much literature highlights the risks uh, that bioenergy production uh, could compete, especially in the global south, with food production. Uh, so causing a phenomenon that has been described as green grubbing. Um, so by uh, replacing uh, uh, food production, it could uh, uh, lead to uh, more malnutrition, uh, poverty, uh, and further contribute to deforestation in, in the global south in particular. OK, just a, a slide quickly on what I was saying uh, before. Um, now, in, in the energy transition, we often talk about critical minerals, uh, rare earths, um, so elements that are essential for the new technology uh, that is needed in the, in the transition. Um, and the European Union has defined uh, critical raw materials as raw, material, raw materials for which there are no viable substitutes with current technologies. Uh, which most consumer countries are dependent on importing and whose supply is dominated by one or a few producers. Uh, the EU also produces lists um, every three years uh, with uh, critical raw materials. The last list is from 2023. But we can say that also in the field of food security, there are such critical materials that are uh, highly geographically concentrated, as in the case of uh, uh, critical raw materials. Uh, for example, um, the literature stresses the importance of phosphate rock reserves for agriculture. Um, and 72%, uh, um, according to the literature of these re reserves, are based in a relatively small area in Morocco and the Western uh, Sahara. Uh, at the moment, China, like in the field of critical raw materials, also plays an important role in uh, uh, the production of phosphates. Um, with, uh, I read, around half of the global production coming from, from China. Uh, also, one of the other uh, um, elements that uh, the energy and the food sector ha have in common is the, the need, uh, great need of water and the impact on water and, and soils. Um, so, for example, uh, to mine uh, critical uh, uh, minerals uh, or to process them, as in the case of uh, uh, lithium, you need a lot of water. Um, and this is the same with agriculture. 70% of water consumption is in, in the agricultural sector worldwide. So the two phenomena, the energy transition and uh, uh, agriculture, uh, to an extent, can compete with uh, for water, for access to water. Uh, water is uh, essential for the production of, uh, of uh, green, green hydrogen, uh, also on top of what I mentioned before. So again, competition uh, uh, for access to water can uh, lead to conflict. And we, we already see several examples of this uh, from Africa to Central uh, Asia. Um, OK, now a quick look at uh, what's happening in, uh, in Europe, in the European Union. Um, as part of the energy transition and from 2020 of the European Green Deal, uh, we see a lot of um, political strategies, uh, communications, um, strat uh, documents that uh, um, drive what, uh, what is under the basket of the European uh, Green Deal. Uh, now, here you see a list I won't touch upon uh, most of these, um, but just to mention a few uh, uh, things uh, that are part of the energy transition and that also impacts on agriculture uh, uh, and food uh, um, production or food imports. Uh, so one of the key elements of the European Green Deal is CBAM, the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, uh, which uh, will be enrolled progressively and uh, eventually uh, it could also have an impact. So the logic is that of taxing uh, imports based on carbon emissions uh, caused in the production of, uh, of those imports. And now eventually this could also apply to agricultural uh, imports. Uh, 
uh, either directly or indirectly. Uh, as part of the Green Deal, we see uh, we had already in 2020 a new biodiversity strategy. And within this context, uh, there has been a lot of discussion about uh, so-called nature restoration uh, law, um, which um, aims at restoring nature on at least 20% un of the Union's land and marine areas by 2030, and eventually all ecosystems by uh, 2050. Uh, now, this is a quick picture of uh, um, what this will concern. Um, and examples of the action that is envisaged. You can see it here. Uh, let me just stress uh, that this law, which is a key part of the European Green Deal, caused a lot of controversy uh, in Brussels uh, because especially agricultural lobbies opposed it and essentially they convinced a good part of the European People's Party, so the largest party, centre-right party in the European Parliament, uh, uh, that this was going to go to the detriment of uh, food production in Europe. Um, by the way, we should keep in mind that food production in Europe is one of the most subsidized fields and also the one of those that have contributed the least to the cut in greenhouse gas emissions. Okay, and to conclude, I think I'm coming to the end of my time. Uh, um, just summing up. Um, at the moment, geopolitical competition uh, is leading to calls for uh, de-risking, essentially limiting uh, uh, dependence on imports. So within this context, inter trade interdependence is seen more, as, more and more as a liability. So we hear you know, the discourse features calls for strategic autonomy in various fields, and food production is becoming one of uh, these fields. However, the risking in some cases might prove counterproductive because international cooperation is necessary or even critical for sustainable development. Uh, so geopolitical conflict might actually have detrimental effects on the energy transition and the sustainable production of food. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marco. That was very uh, illuminating. Thank you. Uh, and sorry, sorry that we have to keep this rather short at this point. We'll, we will have a bit more time uh, for discussion after the next presentation and we will discuss them then jointly. Uh, so if you also have, have still some questions also for Marco, please write them in the chat. Uh, but now we will give the floor to, to Jyrki Niemi, uh, who is a research uh, professor at the Natural Resources Institute, so LUKE, and his work focuses on the analysis of agricultural policies and food markets in Finland and the, and the EU. Uh, and he will now talk about dependencies and vulnerabilities in the global fertilizer trade. Go ahead, Jyrki. You also have about 15 minutes. Thank you, Emma, and a very good Tuesday morning to everyone, dear listeners and webinar participants. It's really great to have the opportunity to talk about this important and timely topic today. And I will tell you today about the increase in the importance of imported inputs in agricultural production worldwide. What the development of the last decades look like? What are the countries or regions that have become most dependent on imported agriculture inputs? And I will I will talk broadly about the global input rate, but my main emphasis is on, on fertilizers here. The dependency on imported agriculture inputs for food production is, is, of course, a very critical aspect of modern agriculture. And the global input market is challenged by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, and geopolitics. Even though the inputs have a crucial role for food production, their role is not always recognized. And, and while there are many, many studies analyzing the international trade of agriculture commodities and food products, studies focusing on global trade of agriculture inputs are, are quite rare. So what I tell you next is largely based on a recent research work we have done to, in collaboration between Aalto University and LUKE. 
and this work is part of the Treform project funded by the Academy of Finland. The study is not yet published. Uh, it covers internal trade flows of agriculture inputs from the last 30 years and analyzes the use and trade of synthetic fertilizers, pesticides and feed, feed crops for over 180 countries. But let's start with the slide that shows the growth of global agricultural production, which has exceeded or outpaced the world population growth in recent decades. So in this slide, we see that global food production has more than quadrupled since the 1960s, along with the increasing demand driven by population growth and, and dietary changes. The production growth has been enabled by the rapid industrialization of the food production, and it has, of course, led to the increased use of agriculture inputs, such as synthetic fertilizers, pesticides, agricultural machinery, and industrial compound feeds. And, and this has, of course, enhanced productivity significantly, but they have also made the maintenance of current food production highly dependent on these inputs. So the global use of inputs has grown, and the increased use of the inputs has been supported by the expansion of trade, thus increasing the import dependency on agriculture inputs globally. In this slide, as an example, we see the drastic change in the use of fertilizers from the 60s until today. The use of nitrogen has increased almost tenfold worldwide since the beginning of 1960s. The use of phosphorus has quadrupled and the use of potassium fertilizers has increased fivefold since 1961. And an increasingly larger share of the use of agriculture inputs relies on imports. So this slide shows the development of global nitrogen use and the growth of international trade of nitrogen. Like I said earlier, the use of nitrogen has increased almost tenfold worldwide but the global imports of nitrogen have increased almost 17-fold in the same, same period. So the share of imports in the use has increased significantly. And uh, in relation to the global use of inputs, the share of imports have increased for all important Im inputs, such as fertilizers, pesticides, animal feed, and so on. So in this slide, we see that how significant is the share of imported inputs currently in agriculture at the global level in different inputs and how it has grown over the last 30 years. Uh, for pesticides, this is based on FAO data and, and, and you can see that it's already it's 100%. But this is not completely true because, because um, here the imports also include other uses than agriculture use, which distorts the data. So don't take it as a as a hundred percent here. And agriculture inputs are of course essential in maintaining the current production level all over the world. And the disruptions to the availability can really have a very drastic impact on the food production. For example, here in a global simulation study done by Aalto University and published last year, the availability of nitrogen, phosphorus and potassium fertilizers, as well as pesticide and agriculture machinery was reduced by 50%. And this resulted in a 26% drop in global maize production and 21% decrease in global wheat production. And in many countries, the re re reduction in production was even more drastic. 
So this shows very clearly that if the supply of the key agriculture inputs is drastically reduced, domestic food production in many countries can be under threat. Furthermore, there is a concentration in the production of the inputs that can create risk in the food supply say, chain. For example, in case of fertilizers, the five biggest fertilizer producer countries supply 60% of the, of the nitrogen fertilizers, 70% of, of the phosphorus fertilizers, and over 80% of the potassium fertilizers. But let's take a look at what is really happening at the global agriculture input trade. And let's start with the nitrogen fertilizers. Here you can see two world maps. The map on the left shows whether the country is currently a net importer or net exporter. The map on the right shows the change in net imports over the 30 years. So if you look now at the map on the left, the darker, the brown color or the red, red, red is brown color on the map, the more dependent the country in question is on nitrogen fertilizer imports in relation to its own use. And the darker, the blue larger the country is as a net exporter. So you can see that many big crop producing countries in North and South America, such as US, Brazil, Mexico, so European countries, and Asian countries as India saw an increasing trend towards higher import dependency of nitrogen fertilizers between 91 and 2020. Also, many sub-Saharan African countries have increased the import dependency of nitrogen fertilizers. On the other hand, then there are Northern, Northern African countries and also countries from Middle East and Russia, which are net exporters of nitrogen fertilizers. And among net exporters, Saudi Arabia shows a particularly strong trend, trend in increasing nitrogen fertilizer export. For phosphorus fertilizers, the global trend shows relatively similar trend as for the nitrogen fertilizers. Nearly the whole North and South America shows trend toward increased import dependency, with the exception of the US, which remains a net exporter of phosphorus. Russia is again dark blue, which means that it is a significant net exporter in relation to its own use. Other big net exporters of uh, Phosphorus fertilizers include countries such as Morocco, China, and Saudi Arabia. And interestingly, China has changed from being a net importer to a net exporter of both nitrogen and phosphorus fertilizers. With the potassium fertilizers, even more countries are net exporters with higher import dependency. So, so you can see that, and that figure and, and, and the concentration of production also. And the EU has also changed from a net exporter of fertilizers to a net importer in all three main fertilizer nutrients. At the beginning of the 90s, EU was still self-sufficient in nitrogen and phosphorus, but not anymore. And in key fertilizers, EU has been a net importer for the entire examination period. Dependency on pesticide imports has also increased in many countries and exports are becoming more concentrated. So here the same peak, so import dependency has been increasing with many South American countries, such as Brazil, 
many European countries as well as Southeast Asian countries. Here also Russia are net import, importers of pesticides and showing an increasing trend toward higher import dependency. And many African countries with previously low use have also increased their use of pesticides and become more dependent on imports. And here again, Noteworthy is the concentration of the net exporters for pesticides, mainly China, India, the US, Argentina, and, and, and then some Western European countries, which are net exporters. And now I will conclude my presentation uh, by stating and repeating something I already said earlier. The dependency on agriculture inputs for food production is critical aspect of modern agriculture. And maintaining production requires the smooth running of international trade. The result of our recent study done by Aalto and Luke show that the import dependency of agriculture inputs has clearly increased over the past 30 years but there is, of course, a very high variation between countries. Major food producing countries in North and South America, such as USA, Brazil, as well as countries in Europe, uh, so high self-sufficiency in their food production, but are still very dependent on imported agriculture inputs for their domestic agriculture. Finland is a very good example of a country with relatively high self-sufficiency, but also heavily and increasingly reliant on imported chemical and energy inputs. And also high dependence on the imported impo imports of supplementary protein feed for livestock production. Sub-Saharan African countries currently still with low input usage, but with increasing intensification are probably the most vulnerable in dealing with disruptions in agriculture input rate. And countries with large populations, such as China and India, is of course, worth paying att special attention. India reveals an increasing trend toward higher import dependency in nitrogen fertilizers for crop production. China on the other hand, shows a particularly interesting case in its changing role in the global agriculture input markets. China has changed from being a net importer of all fertilizers and pesticides to a net exporter of N and, and P fertilizers, as well as major exporter of pesticides. And of course, we also should take a note that it's worth noting that uh, there is also concentration of production of agriculture inputs globally. But I stop here now and ready for any comments or questions. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jyrki. That was very uh, interesting and, and very also good to see the, the figures that are quite, quite striking and clearly showing trends. Um, now, again, I encourage anyone from the audience to write down questions in the chat. Uh, we don't have a lot of time for discussion, but uh, a few minutes. Um, there was a question for, for Marco uh, about uh, the consequences of uh, on the globe uh, that the globe may face in the case of rising tensions in the Indo-Pacific, uh, especially uh, in the Southeast China Sea. So, Marco, do you think that you can comment on that? Yeah, thank you. Uh, just my two cents on this. Um, the question is, is broad. It doesn't just refer to, I uh, mean, the way it was posed at least. Uh, but <laughs> in general, the consequences would be uh, enormous. Uh, if we just, I mean, in terms of the energy transition, uh, for example, um, if we think about the supply of uh, rare earths or critical minerals coming from China, uh, which is 
huge. Uh, this would have a significant impact on, on the energy transition. And the same applies if we think of uh, technologies, green technologies, uh, where China is a leader, for example, in uh, wind turbines, uh, uh, production, photovoltaic panels. Uh, um, the same, this, now I'm moving uh, away from my field, but I, I would assume that the consequences would be huge also in terms of the digital transition. We saw uh, how uh, limited disruptions in supply chain during the COVID crisis impacted uh, in the production of, uh, well, in, in the production and in the supply of semiconductors uh, to Europe. Uh, so the impact on uh, EVs, on uh, electric vehicles. Um, China is also the EU's main import partner at the moment. So while I think some of my <laughs> colleagues here are more qualified to uh, talk about impacts on food security, I think that if we just look at in the indirect impact, so what it would mean in, in terms of higher energy prices, uh, there would necessarily be uh, an effect also on food production and uh, food security in, in, in Europe and the West. Thank you so much, Marco. Uh, now, I think since we don't have any questions right now in the chat, and we can also uh, continue the discussion in the chat, uh, but I think we will now move on to our panel discussion, uh, which is held under the title Drivers and Barriers for More Localized Nutrient Cycles. So we ask our um, our panelists to uh, come to the scene, uh, in other words, uh, switch on their cameras. And I will present our our excellent panelists. Uh, so we have Kaisa Kartunen, who currently works as Professor of Practice in Food Security in the Faculty of Agriculture and Forestry at the University of Helsinki. Uh, but she has also a long, versatile career um, in international and national organizations, such as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Finland and the UN Food and Agriculture Organization. Uh, then we have Kim Morasa, who is a research manager and a senior scientist at the Natural Resources Institute, so Luke. Uh, and he has about 20 years of professional experience in soil science and has also been working on uh, with biomass processing technologies and circular bioeconomy and other issues such, like that. Then we have uh, Tiffany Stephanie, who is heading the government relations and external communications uh, at Yara Europe. Um, and uh, that the company operates in the field of plant nutrition in Europe. And Tiffany specifically works on climate friendly crop nutrition and zero emission uh, energy solutions. And then last but definitely not least, we have Ville Veikko Pitkanen, who has worked as a councillor for the permanent representation of Finland to NATO since uh, September 2021. Uh, representing Finland in the NATO's Resilience Committee, um, which is the senior NATO advisory body uh, for resilience in NATO. So we have a very versatile uh, panel uh, and many questions to address. So let's move immediately to the discussion. Um, uh, I will open up with a, a question to all the panelists. Um, and by the way, also the audience, please feel free to, to uh, again, write your questions in the chat and hopefully we'll have some time for, for audience questions. Uh, but I would open up the, the discussion with a very kind of general question. Uh, but I would like to ask you to uh, sort of summarize from your point of view, what are the main challenges for sustainable agricultural production and fertil fertilizer use in the current geopolitical situation in, in Europe? And, and please feel free to somehow adjust the question to, to your own expertise. Uh, so perhaps we'll start with Kaisa. Um, thank you very much. Yes, indeed, I, I, I thought I could expand a bit outside Finland and outside Europe and have a bit more like global perspective. It was already greatly highlighted by Guy in his uh, keynote speech. I don't want to repeat uh, some of those things he, he mentioned, but when we, when we think that the yield gap 
I mean, the gap that is between the, the potential yield and the actual yield that the farmers get from their farms, that's highest in Africa. So I, I think that also from the fertilizer perspective, we need to we need to look at Africa and try to see what can be done there. This uh, rapid increase in the fertilizer prices uh, after the after the COVID-19 pandemic and the, and the start of the war in in Ukraine, um, it has really affected farmers uh, farmers' capability to to access fertilizers because of these high prices. And even if the world market prices of fertilizer and the ingredients, they have come down since then, the domestic prices are still extremely high in, in many developing countries because of the high inflation that is also affecting those countries. And, and also we have to take into account, as Guy mentioned, the, the high transport costs that are there. So the, so the fertilizers simply are not affordable to farmers in, in developing countries, in particular in African countries, where they already use very little fertilizers in general, as was mentioned, like 20, 20 kilograms or, or a bit more of, uh, of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium together compared to, to many other countries where it's, it can be hundreds of kilos. Per hectare. So there are a lot of a uh, lot of um, problems to address. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Kaisa. Then with the same question, we'll move uh, perhaps to Villeveco next, and feel free to uh, modify the question. <laughs> Thank, thank you very much for the for the opportunity. Uh, first of all, to take part in the panel. Uh, thank you, Luke, and thank you. Uh, Finnish Institute for International Affairs. Uh, it, it's really a privilege to be part of the panel since uh, there are many things already that I have learned today. Um, I'm taking part of the panel from panel from Brussels and from the HQ of NATO, and we became members of this alliance 4th of, 4th of April. So we are pretty green still in, in the alliance. But uh, however, I'm trying to take the perspective of the alliance now, and, and which is currently going through a uh, huge change. It's all about the bringing back the deterrence and defense capabilities. Uh, what comes to the challenges? Uh, I would say that the first challenge is that we have learned in Russia, uh, uh, or uh, we have learned in Ukraine that, that, that both Russia and Ukraine are both using, have, have attacked each other civilian infrastructure and agricultural sector has also had its share in uh, of this destruction and this sector is somehow also it has been weaponized so and as, as we know both countries ukraine is very important global actor similarly is as russia is in the agricultural field so disruptions in these two countries of course uh, are challenging also the sustainability production in, in, in the allied countries. Uh, and this, of course, the situation also weakens Ukraine economically, but raises challenges in other other parts of the world, like it was greatly elaborated by Mr. Mr. Niemi and, and also Gil. And I really like the, I learned that the fertilizers can be more already more, much more uh, expensive than in, 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 for example, Global South, that they are closer to the production sites. So, of course, this is one of the challenges. But another challenge I would say also is that the agricultural sector is very dependent of, of critical sectors like transport, uh, cyber security, and, and especially the energy that we have, that we have learned also uh, quite vividly in, in Finland. So, in the end of the day, no matter this sector, uh, sector is doing, it might not be enough since it would still be a ho hostage of vulnerabilities of other sectors. So this is also one of the deep challenges the sector is facing. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Uh, let's move next then to Tiffany. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, do you hear me well? Perfect. Yes. 
Good afternoon, uh, Emma, and good afternoon, everyone. I think a lot has been said already by the different uh, uh, keynote speakers on the on the challenges. But I think, from our uh, private sector perspective, it's been just uh, what we call the poly crisis uh, from uh, facing uh, the increasing challenges due to the energy price volatility, the supply chain disruptions, as you um, just mentioned. Um, and all this um, basically is is a, a new context in which we have to operate. And there, what we are really uh, focusing on is to balance the economic viability of sustainable practices with the cost of implementing new technologies or uh, adopting uh, stricter regulation, uh, because uh, CD, uh, you also referred uh, to that. It's challenging for the private sector, but it's also challenging for farmers. And I think we also need to acknowledge that uh, in this conversation, whether we talk about uh, Europe or uh, even uh, at global scale. Um, from a European perspective, our approach is that there has been a lot of focus on the targets, but not necessarily on how to reach them. And one of the challenges we face is that, uh, or that we, uh, we see, I would rather say, is that we, um, there is an in insufficient support uh, for farmers to use low carbon fertilizers and use digital tools. Why this can help to basically solve some of the challenges that have been pointed by the keynote speakers, such as uh, the increasing dependency on other parts of the world, uh, sometimes unre unreliable uh, trade partners potentially. Um, and it also helps to basically uh, reduce nutrient losses as well as optimizing uh, the use of the fertilizers. When it comes to the situation in Africa, especially, that's a concern we share. And that's also with this concern that our CEO was recently talking to a couple of uh, uh, journalists uh, in, in Brussels, that basically the increased dependency we see uh, uh, from Russia uh, towards fertilizers in Europe uh, is also valid for uh, the global south and Africa. And it's also valid for grains. And um, we have to be uh, careful in, in the way uh, the new geopolitical context can impact uh, this challenge. We are doing uh, what we can as private sector also to alleviate uh, the challenges for uh, African farmers. Um, so we have donated a significant amount of fertilizers to the World Food Program in the last year since the war in Ukraine. And also our colleagues um, who are active on the ground in, in Africa are developing specific fertilizing products um, that uh, contain a number of nutrients, not just N, P, and K, to really have a, a significant uh, result as soon as uh, farmers use them. And we also uh, work a lot in terms of uh, extension services and, and advice to make sure that uh, fertilizers are used the best possible way. Excellent, thank you, Tiffany. Uh, then finally, for the opening question to Kim. Okay, thank thank you very much, Emma, and good afternoon for everybody. And and I would like to like like to thank Guy as well for for the first presentation, which uh, provided quite extensive list of measures what is need to be done in in Africa uh, when we are trying to solve agriculture related challenges and challenges related to input inputs important inputs. And but I would like to add that. Quite many of those measures and actions need to be taken, taken, uh, taken also in in European agriculture to to make it more, more sustainable, more sustainable and less dependent of imported import, important uh, in, inputs. But it's it's quite clear already that that we need to re reduce the dependence on on these intensive energy intensive mineral nitrogen fertilizer and and limited uh, mined phosphorus fertilizers which are located outside of the Europe and one solution for this is the nitrogen recycling it's only the partial solution but but uh, like Jurgis presentation very clearly highlighted that that we have to take those those actions was uh, possible and and Luke is doing quite much work to, to put forward nitrate recycling. So use those input, inputs what we have in agriculture more efficient way and recycle them, them again. And that's why one way to reduce our dependency on, on, on the input. And I, I would like to really address that this, this is an op opportunity what we we need need to take and take and use it as, as much as possible. Thank you. Indeed, thank you for all of, all of these views, and uh, I think that it's it's also interesting to think that maybe this um, kind of polycrisis situation in in which we are 
can also be seen as a as a kind of an opportunity now to uh, because it's it's such a push uh, to change our practices and so on that we now have to do it which probably would have been smart to do many of these things uh, either way uh, but let's move then to more individualized uh, questions so we'll place a question to each of you uh, more uh, focused on your specific fields um, and i still remind our audience also to to ask questions uh, but let's perhaps go back to Villeveco and the more sort of kind of traditional uh, security point of view uh, because I'm, I'm interested in knowing uh, what the sort of level of discussion and debate uh, is in the in the sort of NATO or EU discussions uh, and to what extent are these questions of agriculture and fer fertilizer use uh, featured in those discussion discussions and is there a need for maybe more dialogue and knowledge sharing on this this topic thank you thank you very much emma uh, first uh, kimo had a great point also here that uh, he pointed out that we also in europe we have to do a bit in in finding new ways and techniques uh, what uh, what is has been done in other countries uh, that's a good good point uh, but to start with emma's question um uh, NATO is defensive alliance. Uh, as we speak, uh, it's building back its defensive capabilities, defense credibility. Uh, we are talking here about the nuclear conventional uh, missile defense capabilities, complemented by space and, and, and cyber capabilities. So at the moment, we can say that in the bigger picture, the focus in NATO is far from the topic that we are discussing today. However, having said this, um, uh, NATO remains an important important forum for non-EU EU countries like US, Canada, uh, UK, Turkey, uh, and to partners uh, which are global, like NATO's uh, Indo-Pacific partners, for example. And, and as discussed, uh, these interdependencies uh, go beyond Europe or transatlantic borders. So of course, uh, these kind of discussions are important in NATO. Uh, NATO has also this senior committee called Resilience Committee, where I'm representing Finland, and, and the committee structure uh, entails also these planning groups, which are transportation, uh, civil protection, uh, energy health, civil communications, but also food and agriculture. So in this planning group, food and agriculture uh, uh, experts from the capitals can share information of the threats uh, of the different sectors, including the agriculture. And NATO also has uh, some baseline requirements for also, for, for example, food and water supply. So in that sense, food and agriculture group in, in, in NATO is really important. It's a very good venue for dialogue uh, and knowledge sharing. And I think one of its strengths is clearly that um, the focus there is, uh, or the discussions there are uh, held uh, from the security perspective. So the lenses of security. And uh, to my knowledge, there are not so many international groups in this sector that uh, in the world where these topics are systematically uh, uh, discussed from the perspective of security. So, and of course now this, discussions are more important maybe than ever because we know that uh, Russia has attacked systematically civilian infrastructure in Ukraine and they have instrumentalized a wide range of topics like energy gas food even even people like it has happened in in within our borders so it is central that potential threats are discussed and shared in all sectors having said all this NATO is not a regulating party so it's uh, discussions and, and um, lessons learned Thank you. Excellent. Good, good to know also this background and, and exactly that uh, these issues are uh, also security questions, while of course uh, at the same time uh, bodies like NATO are of course now also focusing very much and, and mostly uh, on the sort of more traditional security capabilities. Uh, excellent. Thank you, Ville uh, Then we will move on to Kaisa. Uh, and my question to you is, uh, how can the efforts to close nutrient cycles and promote the use of uh, biofertilizers be supported globally? 
uh, and what could be done there to sort of ensure this policy coherence also from the point of view of uh, what has been mentioned here that many of the similar uh, issues that are measures that we need to do in for example Africa we also need to do in in Europe so what's your take on that Thank you. Thank you for the question, which is very pertinent uh, and relevant. And I, I would like to start by thanking Kimmo and also Mikko. His, his uh, opening remarks where you mentioned these examples and experiences from Finland on, on nutrient recycling and, and circular economy. And I think those are, those are the, the issues that we could try also to export to other countries. Our, our experiences from here. But uh, what is happening, for example, in African countries is that uh, because the countries are in uh, and the governments, they are in a need to increase agricultural production. They, they want to get more production. They want to get better food security situation. So that's why they are subsidizing the use of uh, inorganic fertilizers. And they have been doing it, some of the countries, for decades already. So year after year, the government spends a major share of the agricultural budget on subsidizing fertilizers and and they have reasons for that they for example they really want farmers to stop slash and burn agriculture because that is causing deforestation and forest degradation so they would want farmers to settle become become more like settled farmers settled farmers and start using agricultural inputs and and start normal agricultural production and that's why they are they are subsidizing fertilizers for example and they are also providing agricultural advisory services on how to use inorganic fertilizers so if we want to want to make a transition from uh, totally or or um, to a large uh, uh, large use of um, extensive use of inorganic fertilizers to more mixed use of organic and inorganic or fertilizers and, and biostimulants that were mentioned by Guy in his presentation. So we have to look at this uh, current subsidy system very, very critically and, and see if there is a chance at least to start gradually using part of those subsidies going to inorganic fertilizers to production of, uh, of organic and more local fertilizers based on livestock manure or plants or whatever raw materials there are available to, to, to produce organic fertilizers. But of course it has to be it has to take place gradually. Uh, we it can it cannot be done overnight because the production of this Different types of um, of fertilizer, fertilizers will will take 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 time to to get it active, but it requires also research and development investments and in, in research. It requires some quality standards of these new types of fertilizers, and then of course advisory services so that farmers know how to use them uh, in an efficient way. So quite a lot can be done and should also be done. And here we also look at the financing agencies and the donors that are supporting uh, development in many of uh, many of the developing countries, African countries especially. So that's how those funds are directed and, and what kind of um, dialogue we have. We have the governments of those countries so that we could try to help them to find also um, new solutions to, to the agriculture. I quite like the, the concept of integrated soil fertility management that was mentioned also by Guy, so that we look at the, we look at the soils in a more like a like a bigger entity, not only from the from the fertilizer perspective, but we, we also look at other aspects of the soil health. I think I stop here, I, otherwise I'm talking too much. No, thank you. It was very, very interesting. And thanks also for again, I, I guess investments have been pointed out here previously, but but also for bringing in the the whole uh, aspect of financing and subsidies, for example, and how how those uh, perhaps are currently creating these sort of um, mistaken incentives and and should be somehow adjusted a little bit to move us to a new direction. Uh, Great, we will then move on to Kimmo uh, with your individualized question, uh, which concerns the level of technical readiness of producers to adopt new practices. 
uh, and specifically how can researchers and also research institutes support the transition from fossil based to bio based fertilizers? Thank you for the question. And and in general, the technological le readiness level for production of recycled fertilizers uh, is, I, I would say it, it's pretty good. We have nice, good technologies on the markets and there is many kind of new technology in, in pipeline. So we need to still to develop the techno technologies, but there are several already available. Uh, Although we have good technologies, only very small percent of the potential of nutrient recycling is, is currently used. So there is not a lot of space for, for new companies, new uh, fertilizer products, different type of products. But the channels, challenge, main challenge is undeveloped markets of the fertilizer products. And actually, Kaisa emptied the bank already and, and listed quite many, many of those challenges, which are, are in, a, in a way restricting the use of recycled fertilizer. And, and it is true that that economical situation support mineral fertilizers, fertilizers compared to the recycled ones at the moment. So it's, it's not economically feasible in the many cases to use, to use and product, produce those recycled fertilizers. So what Luke is doing, we are struggling with all these issues starting from the soil health discussing with, with the companies how they can produce, produce different type of recycled fertilizers, what is the agricultural performance of, of those products, because that's the information for individual farmers need that they can adopt new, new type of fertilizers. And, and of course, we are calculating nutrient balance in, balances in regional level, uh, national level, EU level, and trying to find places where we have excess of nutrients, where we have biomasses from which we can produce the recycled fertilizers. All these, these uh, information support different type of actors in the, in the field. And, and we are doing work cooperation with, with the companies, with the regulatory bodies, legislative, legislative bodies, politicians in national level and, and all, all also in the Brussels. So, it's very complex issue and, and get provides data. We facilitate the discussion like we do here in, in this, this webinar. So that's that's what research organization can do. We provide valuable information for the decision making. Great. Uh, thank you, Kim. That's that's what we try to do, <laughs> at least. Um, uh, great, thank you for for um, mentioning some of again some of the solutions that are available there we'll then go to the final uh, individual question to tiffany uh, and of course we will bring in the private private sector view uh, so i would ask you what is needed in the private sector to promote transition towards more closed cycles in the especially in the current geopolitical uh, context mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure. So uh, my first point to connect with what uh, the different uh, fellow panelists uh, have been uh, saying is really that uh, for us uh, at Yara and, and I guess uh, for many reasons also uh, uh, for a lot of, uh, of stakeholders, there's a day before and after the war in Ukraine uh, because uh, this shock has exposed the weakness of our food system um, and also the need for us at Yara to diversify, uh, and whether it's about sourcing or the, whether it's about the products we can offer to farmers. But it's also accelerating the urgency for change, connecting with the, uh, um, uh, the discussion we had at the beginning about the need to accelerate also the energy transition. So we are in a way in a perfect storm um, and it's really uh, how we can diversify whilst at the same time from a European perspective, uh, uh, strengthen Europe's strategic autonomy, including in fertilizers. Um, and in food. And for that, there are different ways that have been touched upon by uh, the different uh, colleagues panelists here. So in, in Yara, we have uh, uh, the habit to say that our role is to help farmers to make every nutrient count. And that means that we encourage farmers to use nutrients in the best possible way, starting from on field, on farm uh, nutrients, and then moving into the combination of different fertilizing products as uh, 
was underlining more and more we see uh, synergies and also better results for the crops and, and the environment and so reducing nutrient losses. Then nutrient recycling, that's definitely the second aspect where we are also very active uh, as here in Europe and there the challenge as you pointed uh, um, uh, before, Kimo, is that in a way we are, um, it's a different scale and it's a different business than mineral fertilizers. Organic based fertilizers are more local. They're based on, on recycled nutrients and it would make no sense to ship them from uh, Finland to Sicily. Um, so we also face those challenges when we work in Europe and this is why we have expanded our portfolio, acquiring a couple of companies in Europe to serve um, better uh, that field and encourage more uh, nutrient recycling. Um, and the last aspect, which is really the burning issue for us uh, at Gara, is how we are going to decarbonize our production with the use of renewable energy. Um, as it was pointed at the beginning, this is really one key aspect uh, that we are focusing on. And all this, uh, especially if we look into the nutrient management side, there's a lot we can do already now. And we really empower farmers to do so. So if we take the existing solutions, such as digital tools, precision farming, plus the best practices, farmers can already uh, increase the efficiency of the nutrients they use by 20%. Just like that. We don't need more innovation, and I'm talking about Europe. So imagine the progress we can reach if we would uh, uh, basically scale up and speed up the best practices. Um, so that's for the nutrient management side. And then if we look at the energy transition and the acceleration of the decarbonization. This is not, uh, this is too big of a challenge uh, to solve uh, on one's own. Um, so we, we, we have the habit to say that we as fertilizer industry are ahead of a full scale transformation of our sector. And the only way we can succeed is to take our responsibility as private sector and then join along with all the players across the value chain uh, and taking the farmers with us and the consumers in order to create new business models. That's the only way that we will also be able to finance the transition. It has been highlighted that today um, the cost of uh, producing fertilizers with renewable energy instead of uh, natural gas is having a, a significant uh, price difference. And whether it's about, uh, you know, sharing that cost um, would help really to de-risk the transformation in that field. And I'll leave it at that because I see there are a couple of questions popping for on the panelists. Excellent. Thank you for this. All of all of these news. Uh, I actually see that there is quite a lot of discussion in the chat and a lot of very interesting discussion. Uh, and there are also some some questions to the panelists specifically. So let's take uh, first Kai Granholm's questions on the main connections and considerations for the EU concerning, uh, on the one hand, the reduction of imports uh, from outside uh, EU. Or the dependent dependency on, on these imports on fertilizers, and on the other hand, the climate agenda, and can the climate agenda and the EU climate policy, uh, also including the carbon border tax, uh, accelerate this? And how best uh, these agendas can be simultaneously pushed forward? And what kind of strategy should the EU take with Africa then, if, if the aim is to strengthen agricultural productivity and profitability? Uh, so maybe I'll give the floor to any of you panelists who want to address this, who would like to start. <clears throat> okay, uh, Tiffany. Yes, I'm yes, um... the... Sorry, now there shouldn't be any echo anymore. Um, on the aspect of the, um, uh, the role of climate legislation in Europe, um, and I mean, for me, that, that it definitely refers to cam the carbon border adjustment mechanism where fertilizers and ammonia will be part of the scope uh, um, in a couple of years once it will be uh, fully implemented. And basically, this is a climate, this is an environmental legislation, and it will create a significant improvement because it will level the playing field and embed the carbon cost into the final product. What we see today is that fertilizers produced in the European economic area have a footprint which is 50 to 60 percent lower than uh, what is produced in the rest of the world. Um, so we have a competitive advantage in Europe uh, to offer also fertilizers with a lower carbon footprint already today. Um, and actually to go a step further, what we encourage the carbon border adjustment mechanism to consider and, and, and also European institutions is to also take into account the exports aspect because uh, the CBAM works one way. Uh, so there will be a, a leveling uh, of the playing field with imports. 
but players like us at Yara, we're also exporting to the rest of the world and we will embed this carbon cost, um, offer a low carbon fertilizer or lower carbon fertilizer, but uh, we will not be able to compete on the global market as we can today. So that's where I think the challenge is um, on one side, yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Uh, anyone else would you like to comment on the, the EU question? Yes, Kaiser. Uh, if I'm correct, the question ended um, uh, with uh, with some reflection on what EU should do to help uh, or to support the agricultural productivity in, in developing countries. And uh, I think that there are several things that the EU can actually do. Um, EU can, can support research and development. Um, in agriculture, because I, I think that all everything starts with uh, with up to date knowledge. So supporting research, um, then uh, supporting agriculture related education and ad advisory services um, that can that can help farmers to to adopt improved practices or integrated soil fertility management related practices that was mentioned earlier. And then there's also the incentivize um, uh, public and private sector partnerships because if we really want to if we really want to increase agricultural production and productivity, uh, both public and private sectors are needed for that to make agricultural markets work, work well, to make agricultural input markets work well, to to incentivize private sector private businesses to go for a organic fertilizer development and, and, and business is still quite small scale in, in developing countries, but there's huge potential there. But um, incentives are needed for that. And of course, legislation that is supportive to such development. So this is just to mention a few ways how the EU can, can support. Thank you, Kaisa. Good, good to know. Uh, great. Uh, would Kim or Villevek like to comment on this question? If not, then we can move ahead. Uh, perhaps to ask uh, a little bit still, even though some sort of system level obstacles, I guess, to this transition have already been mentioned, but I would still like to ask you what do you see as the main sort of um, system level problems in sort of uh, kind of hindering this this transition overall uh, to a more sustainable agriculture. Uh, what do you think are the, the biggest sort of structural and systemic uh, problems there? Maybe we'll this time start with Kimmo. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would still go, go for eco economy of of, uh, of farmers and agriculture that maybe there is the subsidize they should be changed it it would should be feasible for farmers to use alternative fertilizers and and like guy in 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 first presentation pointed out that there is several measures that should be done in the in the par parallel and those should be supported. I, I, I would look this from the from the farmers' sides, and I think those are the main key solutions. Great, thank you. Uh, then maybe Villevecko, what, what is your point of view? Uh, thank you. Uh, if you allow me to build on Tiffany's points uh, coming from the private sector first, uh, because I think that's also very valid for, for NATO, because uh, in NATO we have also started to learn more and more how, how dependent the defense defense is of the private sector. When, when we come talk about, you know, logistics, transportation, communications, food, energy. So how to do this uh, cooperation with private sector uh, sensibly is, is one of the one of the challenges because we are here talking about uh, unclassified information classified information to be shared with the uh, with private sector and these are information of the national security so this is one one challenge uh, 
but also one one question will be also for, for private sector if if the if diversification is needed uh, to you know sort of like lift lift back the national security who is paying the bill bill then the, so that would be my next question but uh, if we look at the more comprehensive picture i think that the clear question from this side is that the need, uh, that the war needs to end if we think of, you know, I have read some estimations that if the, even if the war would be stopped today, it would would still take like 10 years f for Ukraine to rebuild its agricultural industry. And uh, but in the in the longer run, uh, I think also in NATO we need to start understanding that uh, we are living in a world which is uh, where crises can't be really like uh, separated from each others. Uh, so we are living in a world of multiple, uh, multiple and overlapping interconnected crises, um, which have all, uh, often also global dimension. That is something some would call this uh, meta crisis. So in this kind of old institutions like NATO, uh, it really requires time to take the necessary steps to upgrade uh, the abilities to work in this kind of environment. So I, so I think that's my 50 cents here. Yes, uh, thanks for also mentioning the role of, I guess, organizations and institutions that, that it also takes time to, to kind of adopt new ways of thinking. Uh, let's go then to Kaisa, what's your view? Well, from the systemic point of view, I, I think it's although we are now focusing very much on agriculture but and, and the kind of primary production, but I think it's important to remember that agriculture is part of a value chain and or a larger food system. And, and uh, if we want to really, um, if we really want to transform the food system, the, then we really have to look at every aspect of it, the, every every actor that we have in the food value chain. And that's then the food processing, the food retailing, catering, and then in the end, the consuming part of, um, of, the, of the food value chain and, and the food system. And how we can how we can then uh, if we want to change the system, how 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 does it happen? If we can find those leverage points that we have to that we have to target, and uh, that will then then uh, then uh, initiate some change processes in the in the system. And of course, the food systems are different in every country, and 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 the leverage points also they are different. Where we need really to target if we want to change something in the system but this kind of systemic thinking in general i think it's important that we realize that agriculture alone does not bring the food to the consumer's table we need other actors in between and and we have to we have to somehow get everybody around the same table to discuss these issues and and these potential changes that need to take place indeed yeah that's that is very true. Uh, then finally, Tiffany on the same topic. Um, yes, I think uh, I will simply build on what you said, Kaisa, about the need to have the, the partnerships. And uh, if you have these partnerships across the whole value chain, then it's also easier to speed up investments and especially innovation in the field of the energy transition. So um, also connecting with the security aspect, um, there's the obvious part that there cannot be a, a security overall if there's no food security. But there's also the second aspect that um, the energy security is becoming more and more a uh, determining factor. And if we manage to succeed uh, um, through the energy transition, um, also for uh, energy intensive sectors like the production of fertilizers, we can contribute to realizing Europe's uh, zero emission future but we can also become less dependent on fossil fuels and so on, on Russian gas. So it's like a um, three birds, one stone, if I may say so. So really, we believe this is uh, uh, the way forward and, and we're working quite actively in that space. Um, among other things, uh, we are of course uh, supportive of the Paris Agreement um, and uh, our ambition is to be climate neutral by 2050 as Yara, because I saw there was a question on that um, in the chat how we're we doing that so we have significantly reduced the scope one and two emissions by 55 percent since 2005 in in europe looking at our european 
plants and it's 45% uh, globally. Now the next frontier is scope three emissions um, because about 60% of our emission profile happens at field level. And this is where we come back to the previous topic of nutrient uh, use efficiency and making every nutrient count. There is a significant also gain in being more efficient with the nutrients uh, um, used in the field to also reduce uh, scope three emissions. Um, and last but not least, we invest in different ways to decarbonize our facilities. So the end game for us is uh, uh, the production on the basis of renewable energy, what we call uh, green ammonia. Um, and we believe uh, that uh, we also need blue ammonia, so via yeah, carbon capture and storage as a bridge to get there. So we have a project pilot, a pilot project with a 34 megawatt electrolyzer that we are now uh, uh, finalizing in one of our plants in Norway where we will be producing uh, fertilizers on the basis of renewable energy. And um, we also have a significant carbon capture and, and storage project with one of our plants in the Netherlands. It is the biggest uh, uh, carbon capture and project in Europe. Um, it's uh, about um, the equivalent of 160,000 uh, uh, CO2 emissions equivalent of cars every year that will be reduced by capturing this carbon and then putting back into the uh, Norwegian uh, sea uh, bed. Um, so those are the different ways we are uh, working besides energy efficiency and all the existing gains we have done on scope one and two, where we are reaching the we are reaching the technical possible as of today. <laughs> Great, thank you so much. Uh, we're reaching the end of the the panel, but I would still like to ask you to summarize relatively briefly uh, actually um, we have been talking a lot about different solutions and maybe win-win situations and so on but are there any low-hanging fruit uh, in a way that that you think at least should be done and and that would make sense to to do and that would be relatively easy to do as well from your point of view in order to improve the situation our readiness to face these these challenges uh let's perhaps start with uh, Kaisa this time. Okay, um, if I may, I still stick to, to developing countries here and I think that uh, we don't yet have enough knowledge on the current status of the soil health, at least in many developing countries. So. Uh, I think that one solution and the first steps to take is really to better understand what is the current status of nutrients in soils, what is the current uh, soil, soil health situation in general. Um, it's not it's not an easy solution. It takes time. It takes resources to to organize this kind of um, studies. Um, but then that would really help the decision makers. Uh, advisors and also farmers to to apply um, apply the right measures to improve their the soil fertility, what, whatever the whatever the current situation is, and then then choose the right uh, right measures, whether it is inorganic fertilizer, whether it is lime, to to if the if the pH value of soils is is too low. Um, or maybe maybe it's organic fertilizers, biostimulants, or whatever measures are are available. So I, I think that I would start by by analyzing the current status of soils. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Kaisa. Uh, how about Kimmo? Thank you, as soil science. A scientist, I once again agree with Kaisa, <laughs> Kaisa and, but maybe I would like to continue maybe some demo or investment type, type, type of help for, for companies who are investing and, and producing new recycled fertilizers so that we can have a showcases where, where we are producing good quality recycled fertilizers and use them together with the agriculture uh, farmers so that we really can see the benefits in, in the large scale. Maybe this kind of lighthouse uh, demo activities would, would be good and easy way to kind of increase awareness of, of the potential of the recycled fertilizers. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks, Kimmo. Uh, then Stephanie, I'm sorry, Tiffany. 
no problem. Um, for me, the low hanging fruit, I think I'll, I'll repeat myself, is really to focus on the use uh, in the field where we can significantly reduce the losses. Um, and this goes together with uh, accelerating the recycling part of uh, nutrients. Um, I will not add, I mean, I wouldn't add more than repeating what uh, my fellow panelists have been saying, so I'll stick to that. But for, for me in Europe, uh, uh, that's definitely where we can have the highest uh, return on investment, uh, the fastest. Great, thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. And then finally, Ville Veikko, what do you think? Thank you. From the NATO perspective, uh, the question is easy to answer. Uh, though NATO is not a regulating body in this field, it should uh, still continue to be active in this, this matter and continue to share best practices among allies of the food and security uh, agricultural areas. Uh, the, it's important to avoid still vulnerabilities in this sector since the interdependencies between different sectors are clearly established. So I'll highlight that NATO plays a role, especially when these topics are discussed through the lenses of security. Excellent. Thank you to all of the panelists. This has been really uh, illuminating, at least for me, and I'm sure to, to all of our audience as, as well. So thank you very much for your very expert points of view. So now I have the ungrateful task of somehow summarizing the whole uh, the, the results or the outcomes of the webinar, which I think uh, otherwise, of course, it's a really nice task because there we have had such interesting discussions. Uh, but at the same time, it's really difficult to summarize this into a few uh, sentences. Uh, I guess what I can say is that we clearly have a host of problems uh, arising with the poly crisis, with the, with the war, uh, with energy transition, with climate change, all of these changing changes happening at the same time. Uh, but then we also have a lot of uh, solutions that are or, already uh, available. But maybe the, the main problems with implementing these solutions are exactly these um, uh, structural problems be behind um, behind the, in a way, the, the ways in which the current practices have evolved. Um, so it's very difficult to move into another new and perhaps even better practice uh, just because there are certain sy system level um, sort of traditions and, and just uh, kind of path dependencies that, that force us to do things in a certain way. Uh, and as has been mentioned many times, uh, there is also a lot of uh, cross-sectoral interdependency um, between different sectors. Um, there's also issues of political interests, of course, and also uh, financial incentives that are not always, um, uh, in a way, uh, the best at the moment for um, mobilizing change. Uh, and also there is this uh, increasing risk of, of uh, heavy dependency uh, in many European countries, but also, for example, in many African countries on, on these agricultural input, inputs. Um, so how then to move along uh, from, from these, these problems and these system level uh, issues? I, I think some of the, the sort of solutions that have been mentioned here are in fact, there have been many solutions that have been mentioned uh, and, and clearly one issue that is needed in order to implement them is, is really just the investment and these financial uh, incentives that have to be set right. Perhaps there is still a need for uh, increasing research and these kind of demonstration pro uh, uh, projects and also then perhaps uh, for some sort of investment uh, support for companies, uh, perhaps also uh, research funding for, for being able to, to have better information to understand what we, we should do. Uh, but indeed, the, the problems often are structural uh, and we do need quite, um, quite sort of um, big changes in order to ensure that we move towards more sustainable agriculture. Uh, but perhaps we can also see that this poly crisis and, and the, the challenges that we're facing now are also kind of mobilizing this, this change and we kind of just have to embrace the momentum in order to move forward. Um, 
so I guess that's that's it from from us. Uh, and I hope that all of you who can understand Finnish will join us on the 6th of, of March for the following webinar. But at this point, I would just like to ta uh, thank uh, all of our really, really great speakers for your inputs um, and all of my colleagues, both here at FIA and at Luke for uh, helping out with the, with the webinar. And of course, all of our great audience. And thanks for the uh, discussion in the in the chat as well. But thank you from me.